Hello everyone. So in this lecture, we are going to cover how to apply managerial economics concept in managing in the global economies. So in this chapter, we are going to cover several topics, including import export sales and exchange rates, outsourcing, market for US dollar for as foreign exchange, the determinants of long-run trends in exchange rates, the purchasing power priorities, and also how we are putting the managerial perspective in international trade business. In today's date, most of the company running either nationally right, in the US or maybe um, um, overseas, um, any foreign firms right, that operate um, in different countries. We are becoming more and more of a um, global economies now that the firms are not only just having competitions within the nations, but they are also competitors with other companies who produce the same kinds of products somewhere else in the world. Of course, those companies are going to face different constraints such as the domestic policies, tax, and other forms of environmental restrictions. But um, in general, they are still um, competing with each other within um, certain kinds of similarities. Like for example, Nike in the United States, they are going to import goods from China or maybe Vietnam for their shoes, and they are going to sell it domestically in the US. Well, at the same time, Nike might actually produce the goods somewhere else um, in the world, sell it in the US, but also at the same time exporting the goods to other places um, to sell in the world. <clears throat> so it's becoming more and more of a global economy that we are looking at in terms of competitions instead of the local domestic industry um, levels. There are several things that we would like to actually um, uh, talk about in this global economy studies, such as analyzing the exchange rates, how exchange rate actually play an important rules in the uh, global economies, and look at the purchasing power parities, and basically um, looking at the purchasing power um, compare different countries and how that plays an effect on the import and exports. And also regional trading blocks and emergence um, economies. And of course, uh, we might actually want to look at um, some domestic issue in the US, such as the US trade deficits. Well, generally speaking, foreign exchange, it's basically <clears throat> explodes into several different kinds of risk factors, such as transaction risk exposure, translation risk exposure, and operating risk exposure. So when we talk about transaction risk exposure, we basically refer to the exposure occurs when a fixed price purchase agreement or sales contract for a specific transactions commit the company to make future payable or accept future receivable in the foreign exchange uh, or foreign currency. So you can think about how um, Apple, they are selling the products in Japan and they are accepting Japanese yen as comparing to they are selling the product in the US. So whenever the product was sold in, in, the, in Japan, the country, those money received by the company in uh, Japan right, in, uh, for Apple are basically going to take the foreign, uh, foreign currency and transform it back, right? so to, to basically exchange it back into the US dollar so that the money can flow back to the US-based company. So that actually takes some kind of risk because the exchange rate is actually changing every day in the world. Right? So sometime when we are seeing one of the um, currency actually drop in the markets, might actually have a significant impact to the account receivable in the future periods. A translation risk exposure basically occurs when a company 
foreign assets or liability are affected by persistent exchange rate trends. Accordingly, the accounting books in the home countries must be adjusted. So again, similar kinds of uh, risk exposure here, which um, mainly relies on the foreign assets or liabilities. So that means what well, the assets that uh, the company holds in a foreign country, where um, the liabilities or the foreign assets uh, might actually um, affected by the exchange rate assets at the same time. And those are going to mark in, into the accounting books um, in the home country. Um, so those kind of risk needs to be adjusted as well. The last one is called operating risk exposure, which occurs when the foreign exchange fluctuation that result in substantial changes in the operating cash flows of foreign subsidiaries. Um, like those um, befalling Toyotas for the um, Silica GTS. Right? So it's basically an example of how the foreign exchange fluctuations might actually affecting um, how the operating cash flows uh, for producing such kind of products in the foreign country. The market for the US dollar um, actually play a very significant role in the global economy in general. So most of the trades that happens in the world in, um, at this moment are majority um, account by the US dollar. So there are several reasons for that. Right? So first of all, um, the US dollar is probably one of the most um, um, uh, representable um, uh, currency indicator in the world where um, the currency is very stable most of the time right? Um, in comparison to most of the major currency in the world, including including euros, um, Australian dollar, Canada dollar, um, Mexico pesos, um, and Japanese yen, or maybe even uh, China um, uh, RMB. So therefore, US dollar is uh, one, actually is the most um, uh, used uh, currency in the global economy trades. So when we talk about a US dollar, um, of course, you can think about um, there will always be some sort of demand and the supply of the US dollar in the global economy because people need the US dollar to make transactions with other and therefore the demands for the currency will exist. But of course, at the same time, you want to also think about if there is a demand for the currency, well, there should always be a supply for it. And of course, um, as most of you guys know, the supply of the US dollar is determined by the um, Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. So it's controlled by the uh, Fed in the U.S. So therefore, when we are doing a um, supply and demand analysis on the U.S. dollar, you can always think about the equilibrium price of the U.S. dollar are basically formed by the demand of the U.S. dollar in the world as compared to the uh, supplies um, by the Fed. There's speculative demands and government transfer and coordinated um, interventions that we would like to talk about a little bit later. Uh, Short-term exchange rate fluctuation can also be explained by the, um, uh, by the uh, supply and demand model of the US dollar. So generally speaking, you can think about <clears throat> how um, the change of the supply of the US dollar might actually play an important role um, in the um, US dollar exchange rate market. Well, the graph here basically demonstrates how the shift of the supply curve to the right, well, aka um, increase of supplies of the US dollar, um, going from the year of 2001 all the way to 2008, assuming the demand for US dollar currency is stable within this period, the shift of the supply curve basically indicate that the exchange rate of the US dollar might vary in the global economy based on these um, changes of the supplies. Well, of course, um, this is basically just a simple illustration of how the shift of the supply curve might actually affecting the um, uh, the uh, exchange rate of the US dollar in the world. Um, but generally speaking, you can also imagine how the demand uh, shifting in the uh, global market might also have an impact 
to the exchange rate of the US dollar as well. So the shift of the supply or the demands in the um, global economy might actually play an important role to the short term um, uh, uh, fluctuations of the US dollar exchange rate. But in general, the long term trends in the exchange rates can be um, understand or it maybe can be determined by several macroeconomic factors, such as the real growth rate of a country, the real interest rates, and also the expected inflation. So those are the key determinants of the US dollar exchange rate where most of the business actually always um, look into as a indicator of the future um, movements of the US dollar exchange rate. Taking an example, the um, real interest rates can most of the time be controlled by the Fed, right? because the Fed actually has the monetary uh, uh, the policy tool that can actually make an impact to the short-term interest rates and also the long-term interest rates in the economy. And as a result of that, sometimes when the interest rates actually increase or decrease, might actually have a significant impact to the US uh, exchange rate dollar. The easier way to think about how the interest rate might affect the US dollar, you can think about how a foreign investor who has, let's say, sitting with um, $10 million of yen in Japan, and this person might want to actually find some uh, investment um, uh, tools in the world. When the interest rates offer in the United States is high, that means the return for investing US dollar is high in the future, this investor might actually exchange the Japanese yen into US dollar, and therefore driving the demands of the US dollar up. As a result, well, the uh, exchange rate of the US dollar will increase um, versus the Japanese yens. So you can actually think about the reverse when the interest rate decrease in the United States, that makes the US dollar less, um, 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 less uh, 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 interesting or maybe less profitable uh, to invest in the global economy. And as a result of that, the demand for US dollar will decrease. And as a result, um, the, uh, the price of or the exchange rate of the US dollar might actually decrease. So one way or the other. And if you can actually now imagine how the shift of the supply and the demand might also have like the impact to the exchange rate in the global economy, you can now kind of like simply putting this relationship together and trying to understand why sometimes um, the exchange rate um, might actually vary in the global economies. And in this case, we are looking at something that's um, are related to um, yens and euros um, in the global economy um, in versus the US dollar. And this is a little bit more of a dynamic model that we can actually now observe how simultaneously the shift of the supply and the demand might play an important role um, to the determinations of the uh, equilibrium exchange rates in the market. Another very important concept covered um, in the global economy study is that um, we can always look into the purchasing power parity to help making a managerial decisions of a international trade company. Well, the idea about purchasing power parity are basically stern from the fact that if there is such um, uh, countries, uh, the two countries in the world, where there is no um, significant transportation costs like legal implement or cultural barrier, um, and the uh, two countries have very similar types of culture and goods and services that they produce locally, we are always thinking about the two countries are so close, right? So so similar that anything that they produce within the country, even that the currency they use are different, but the the price of those goods or services should be very very similar uh, 
in values uh, between the two. And uh, because they are having the same values of those goods and services, we always call this the law of one price. So the law of one price basically tell us that if those are the goods and services that worth almost the same values in the two different countries, as long as we can calculate the exchange rate correctly or appropriately, then we should always get the value correct of the two goods. And this um, law of one price actually helps explain a lot of the phenomenons in the global trading. And when we're talking about absolute purchasing power parity, we basically refer to any differentially higher core price inflations in one country or locations than the other, it usually will result in a depreciation of that currency in that one location. So you can imagine, let's say we are trying to think about countries like Canada and the US. We are very close to each other, right? so there are very there is a very minimum transportation cost for trading the goods and services. And uh, most of the culture uh, barrier are very limited because we are sharing very similar culture. And let's suppose we are thinking about um, having a iPhone um, selling in the US and the iPhone selling in the Canada. And they are producing the iPhone locally in each country. Let's suppose um, right now the exchange rate for Canada to the US dollar is two Canadian dollar to one US dollar. If that's the case, well, the, the phone that's selling in the US, let's suppose, is $1,000, and it should be, by the law of one price, um, it will cost the Canadians to uh, purchase the same iPhone with 200 uh, or 2,000 um, Canadian dollar. So 1,000 to 2,000 price. However, if we calculate the exchange rate correctly, right, so that basically translates into the same values of the iPhone. However, if one day there is a country, let's say United States, <clears throat> now having an inflation of uh, the iPhones, and that now increased the price of iPhone from $1,000 to $3,000, right? Well, this is purely just um, uh, based on the domestic inflation situations. It has nothing to do with the exchange rate yet. But as you can imagine, imagine um, if that is the case, when the Americans um, trying to buy an iPhone again, um, they might actually think about hmm, maybe it's a better to buy the iPhone directly from Canada instead of buying the one that produced in the United States. And the main reason is because well, the one that produced in Canada now is charging only two thousand Canadian dollar, which translates into one thousand U.S. dollar. And it doesn't really make sense to spend $3,000 US dollar to buy the same exact product. And as a result of that, well, there will be a lot of um, export will be um, uh, going from the Canada country for that iPhone product into um, imported into the US market. Well, because of this arbitrary uh, opportunity, right? So company can actually make profits in Canada for selling the products um, in Canada to the United States. Um, and therefore, there will be a very significant uh, 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 decrease in supply in the United States for iPhone. So this situation will not continue in the long term because, well, at the end of the day, um, we still want the uh, or maybe there are manufacturers in the United States, they still want to make sure that they can actually sell that product um, to the domestic market and maybe sometime to the um, global market. And as a result of that, um, <clears throat> the price of um, iPhone in the United States will continue to um, um, basically um, tracing that, um, that price difference right between the two uh, the Canadian dollar and the US dollar. And in this case, instead of two Canadian dollar exchange for one US dollar, this exchange rate will slowly adjust for that uh, reason of law of one price. So we want to make sure that the value of the iPhones are exactly the same in the United States to the US by the law of one price. And as a result, the exchange rates between Canadian dollar to the US dollar will slowly adjust for that reason. And as a result, well, 
if we want to actually eliminate this arbitrary uh, opportunity between um, the US and the Canadian border, the exchange rate will slowly getting close to two Canadian dollar to three Canadian dollars. So therefore, by looking at this example, you can easily imagine how an inflation can play a very important role in purchasing power parity that actually affecting the number of exchange um, of import and exports, and also how it affects the exchange rates uh, between the countries um, overall. As mentioned before, the purchasing price parity actually helps um, many managers answer very difficult questions such as how big the foreign business opportunity really are. So if we have an economy that is super, super active and expanding and growing, then obviously this is where you might want to actually invest your, your business right, into this country. Well, one very challenging thing is to um, measure the types of um, activities um, or business activity in a particular country is that, well, those exchange rates are actually constantly changing. So therefore, um, in order to get a better picture of the true business um, uh, opportunity or activities in a country comparing to other is basically having some sort of like comparisons or maybe a true estimated um, uh, um, uh, uh, business activity figures so that we can actually understand how one country actually compared to another. So to get that kind of measure, we still have one more hurdle that we have to actually consider. Think about how um, the overall price in the United States as comparing to the overall price levels in um, a developing country like maybe in China. Um, most of the goods in China are much cheaper as comparing to the US. Well, not only just because of the exchange rates are different, but even considered exchange rate, we still found that the cost of living in China are much lower as comparing to the United States as well. Well, therefore, if we are only comparing, let's say, GDP of the countries, we might actually have some sort of misunderstanding of how active the business um, are in each other country. Therefore, one way to kind of like calculate that purchasing power parity is to take into account of both the GDP figure of a country and the cost of living of the country. And in this table here, what we are presenting, it's basically trying to compare how are, uh, different countries in the world um, with the estimated, um, not estimated, but uh, the GDP uh, purchasing power parity adjusted with inflation as compared to, or the cost of living in this case, not inflation, uh, but the cost of living as compared to the United States. So as you can see, the first column here basically showing you how um, we are using the GDP PPP adjusted to represent the, um, the, the business activities in the United States. So there is uh, $15.1 trillion of GDP adjusted with that uh, cost of living in the US. So that's basically a, a good figure to kind of like see how active right, so business are in the United States. Because the more transactions we have, the more GDP um, uh, we will uh, encounter. However, if you look at China on the first columns, you might found that the GDP in China is only $7.3 trillion. However, if we are going to adjust for the cost of living in China, we are getting a GDP purchasing power parity adjusted for cost of living now going up to $11.3 trillion, which is much closer to the United States as comparing to the previous figure of the nominal GDP. So the main reasons you are seeing the difference between the GDP um, in nominal terms and the GDP in the PPP adjusted term, it's mainly because the cost of living in China is much cheaper compared to the United States. So we cannot just take into account of how much of the goods and services are being traded, but we have to also in, in, um, uh, take into consideration of how um, expensive those goods are um, in each of the countries. 
So as you can see across the board, most of the developed country like Japan, Germany, and UK, you will see the nominal GDP will be, um, most of them are lower, um, or um, the GDP purchasing power parity adjusted figure will be lower than the actual nominal GDP. And the main reason is because uh, the cost of living in those countries are higher uh, than the developing countries, such as uh, Mexico, uh, Turkey, and Poland. So this is basically um, an, another way to kind of like reflect that um, true um, business opportunity um, in um, our global economies. Well, except for the absolute purchasing power parity, um, or the example that we have seen before, um, sometimes we have an alternative, which is less restrictive forms of law of one price, which is known as relative purchasing power parity. So the, the idea basically is um, hypothesized, um, saying that in comparison to a period when exchange rate between two countries are in equilibrium, and any changes in the differential rates of the inflations between the two countries will also be offset by equals, but opposite um, changes in the future spot exchange rate. So if we look at the equations um, below, you can actually imagine um, what we mean by sport exchange rates and um, how we are reflecting the equations with um, inflation rates. So the S1 basically reflecting a future um, exchange rates between the two countries, and S0, subscript zero, basically represent the current um, exchange rates, um, and we call this a sport exchange rates, right? spot ex exchange rates of the two countries. And that can always be equal to the offsets of the two inflations between the two countries. So one plus pi under script H, the pi under script H basically represents the inflation rate in the home country, if you want to think about the US, you can think about the, uh, the inflation rate in the US and divided by one plus the inflation rate of a foreign country, right? for example, in Japan. And once we have all the number in the more in the recent periods, let's say, well, I know what is the exchange rate today between the US and the Japan's um, yens, and we can now calculates the future exchange rates, which is S1 using the equations here. Let's assume that, well, the, um, the inflation rate in the United States, pi H is equal to 2%, 0.02, and the inflation rate in Japan is 1%, 0.01. And to calculate the future exchange rate with this relative uh, purchasing power parity, it's basically using 1.02 divided by 1.01 .01 and multiply by the current exchange rate. Let's suppose, I don't know, 107. And that will return an exchange rate um, in uh, these calculations that reflects the S1, which is called the future spot uh, exchange rate. So this is another very useful tool uh, most of the time for manager to kind of like figure out what could be a estimated um, exchange rate in the future period. But of course, you don't want to rely this um, calculation too much uh, for a longer term predictions, but this could be a, a good um, calculations to give an idea about the exchange rate in the short term. Let's say maybe quarterly, um, maybe a uh, half a year, or maybe sometime in a annual base. <clears throat> of course, we have covered um, uh, quite a few topics on purchasing uh, power parities. But of course, um, the appropriate use of this are basically um, are very specific. Right? So you can think about how international businesses and finance of exchange rates, um, they uh, trends does not actually allow any um, fine tunes, right? So in the markets, um, it does allow a better medium-term uh, planning 
of uh, production volumes or proactive pricings for target markets and segment uh, distribution channels, all of which might offer profit advantage. But some companies uh, make actually these uh, considerations a focus of the business plan and prosper in the international markets. Arda may, uh, may be a, a, a little bit less successful, right? Well, in the short runs, therefore, um, price stickiness in the trade goods um, combined with the naming likes behavior of her uh, exchange rate speculator uh, might actually cause uh, nominal exchange rate to overshoot or maybe understood the equilibrium level in adjusting to the demand or monetary shocks. To avoid this kind of problems, uh, many analysts actually perform a cross-border comparisons of the price level or trade statistics using purchasing power parity to estimate for maybe um, the prior 15 years period. There are several ways that we can actually use the purchasing power parity in general, but most of the um, time we are definitely depends on this to tell us um, how um, uh, to make that decisions of our international business, whether to set a factories in a certain countries, or maybe should we sell our product in there, or should we actually import um, products directly from the country and taking the productions um, in this uh, foreign country and sell the product in the local uh, domestic border. Um, all of this are basically stern from this um, very uh, powerful measurements of the purchasing power parities. In a managerial perspective, uh, within the regional trade bloc like the EU, the NAFTA, or maybe even the Mercosur, um, or maybe Asian Pacific um, Economic Corporations, sometimes called APAC, um, each of these members um, are basically designed to improve the economic growth by specializing in accordance with the comparative advantage and engaging um, any possible free trades uh, between uh, countries within the member groups. So this kinds of trade agreements or maybe organizations are very, very important to making a determination of where your um, global business should um, be in because some of these operations or maybe some of these um, um, uh, agreements or uh, cooperations might actually have a significant impact to the cost of trading between the countries uh, within the networks. <clears throat> Taking examples here, <clears throat> you can think about how um, most of the um, uh, Europe's uh, country, right, the EU countries, are having um, a lot of the um, goods and services exchanged within the regions um, of the Europe's, um, and also same for Asian uh, countries like China, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Japan, um, and many others. Um, same for the um, America, right? So we have the North American trade agreements with um, Canada, and also uh, we have a trade agreement with uh, Mexico. And those are also <clears throat> very big uh, trade agreements uh, between the three um, countries that allows them to trade freely and with very low cost um, uh, between uh, for most of the products. Um, if you look at uh, some of the figures in this graph, you can actually um, kind of like understand um, the, the countries that actually within the WTO members, they are usually the one that actually have more um, active tradings in the world as comparing to um, those who are not right um, in the um, uh, W2, uh, WTO uh, agreements. Um, where uh, the economy might actually have less of the um, uh, proportions of the GDP that um, gets into the, um, uh, the import and export uh, categories. Um, so generally speaking, um, those agreements are, are very important um, for um, global business owner to, to consider uh, where their um, targets might 
uh, or target markets uh, might actually want to be or maybe where they want to actually get the product produced um, in order to take advantage of those uh, trade um, agreements. Some nations actually reject free trade policy and instead they tr are trying to attempt to retain the purchase of the foreign imports in order to expand the productions of the domestic industry by artificially raising the price of substitute foreign products using protective tariff. So tariff is basically a form of import tax that basically put additional costs on the foreign products or service uh, before they hit the, um, uh, the domestic markets. So you can think about how sometimes um, countries like uh, Vietnam, they might actually want to protect their local um, domestic um, uh, brands. Um, let's suppose like running shoes, right? Um, let's suppose uh, that there are some company in Vietnam, they actually produce running shoes locally, but they might not actually get um, enough competitiveness to the foreign countries, uh, company like Nike's or maybe Adidas. So one way for the Vietnam governments to protect those domestic industry is basically putting a protective tariff on Nike and Adidas or such in order to increase the competitiveness of the local products um, within the markets. So again, there are some arguments here. <clears throat> so in um, <clears throat> to put a, a control or protective tariff uh, into um, a, um, a, a domestic country, usually uh, basically used to protect any infant uh, industries, right, until they actually meet or reach the minimum efficiency, efficient scales um, in the productions until they grow bigger, right? until they can actually take full advantage of a, uh, a cost of the productions. Um, and the second argument here is to offset um, any other government subsidy provided to the go uh, foreign competitors with one owns um, countervailing duties. Um, as you can imagine, um, some countries like Australia or maybe China, they might actually have the governments to subsidize a lot of this exchange uh, goods and services, like exporting the goods to a foreign country. So any company produced in China, they might actually get getting certain um, tax benefits uh, from the governments so that they can actually lower their price uh, to sell the products in the world. And in order to fight those uh, back, um, 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 some of the domestic countries, they might actually put tariff on these products so that they can actually avoid this kind of um, unfair competitions uh, in the global economy. Another argument is to impose an anti-dumping uh, uh, sessions <coughs> for foreign goods sold below their domestic cost. Um, this is another um, example of how um, some of the developing country um, are trying to um, selling the product extremely low cost uh, to the world, um, and we call this um, dumping um, actions. Um, and because they are they are dumping so much of these uh, cheap low cost uh, products or service in the world, uh, some of the um, businesses or industries in the domestic border of let's say United States or maybe Germany, they might not run. Um, enough competitiveness uh, with these uh, uh, competitions in the world, and they might actually uh, fail um, to, to survive. So in order to help uh, sustainably um, surviving the local industries and, and avoid this kind of dumping behavior, um, um, some of the tariff uh, actually can be used as a protective uh, policy to those uh, domestic firms. So there are some um, strategies of trade policy that we might have already mentioned, um, such as um, WTO, which is um, the World Trade Organizations, have some very effective uh, spearheads. Uh, the negotiations of mutual trade uh, liberalizations policy. Um, however, right, <clears throat> the reductions of tariffs when trading partners the Bernie refused to relax import controls or open the domestic economy, um, show them uh, makes sense too. Um, for example, if we look at the US tariff 
on Japanese customer uh, consumer electronics uh, products. That's basically a, sh a strong indication, sometimes even a, um, um, a capitalism uh, economy or free trade economy like the United States might sometimes also want to um, use those kind of uh, protective policy um, to protect the local uh, uh, industries um, as compared to, uh, as competing the um, the 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 foreign uh, comp competitors right uh, coming from the Japan's um, countries. Um, you can think about uh, products such as um, uh, uh, PlayStation's game consoles, um, things like um, uh, audio device, um, sometimes like televisions. Um, so all of this are basically um, very, very effectively produced in Japan, right? So those are the electronic products that you usually see in the market that produced by Japanese company um, because they are so good and also with a reasonable cost and, and we are purchasing so much of them. And that basically also translate that, well, there are a lot of the US uh, local domestic industry uh, basically running um, very uh, less competitive to, to those firms. So in order to help the survival of these firms in the US, um, some forms of uh, uh, protective trade policy might be in place for that reason. One of the um, uh, largest um, trade agreement that um, involved the United States is called the um, NAFTA trade agreement. Um, it's, it's basically standing for North America Free Trade um, Agreement. Um, from this um, trade agreement, uh, we actually um, know that um, the three uh, North America countries, the US, um, Canada, and Mexico, are basically the three that actually got involved with this trade agreement. Um, and, and from the below um, pie charts, um, you can literally see how each of these foreign countries um, have those um, trades uh, either import or export with the United States. Um, about 14.92% of the good export share are basically coming from uh, Mexico or exported to Mexico, and about 19.34% of the uh, products in uh, or the exported product from the US are going to Canada. So you can actually see how um, important sometimes this trade agreement will affect the behavior of a of a country, um, even um, like the United States. Um, you can also observe that um, the imports are also um, given the two countries the biggest um, share in the pie chart, except for China, of course. Uh, we are buying, the United States are buying 19.66% of the import goods and services from China directly. But if you look at uh, Canada and Mexico, they are also taking a fairly good big share of those uh, imports. Um, so we are bringing 12.39% uh, of the import goods from uh, Mexico and 14.65% of the import goods from uh, Canada. So um, if, if, if that's basically um, uh, a chart that actually gives you an idea of how important it is sometimes to uh, take into consideration when you're making a business decisions uh, where you want to target a market or maybe how you want to expand your business. Um, as long as you are running a business um, in the United States, um, now if you're looking at this um, uh, North American trade uh, uh, free trade agreement, you might actually want to consider the next uh, country that when when you are considering for the expansions of your business, you might want to actually first consider either taking the markets in Canada or maybe taking the markets in Mexico. And there have been a lot of giant firms that are taking advantage of this uh, free trade agreement, such as uh, Chrysler, General Motors, um, Walmart, uh, Dollar Trees, um, <coughs> all of this <coughs> big giant company in the United States are currently taking a full advantage of running the business in both the Canada and the Mexico um, for selling their goods or maybe the service uh, in this um, uh, 
free, free trade countries uh, within the networks. Of course, um, <clears throat> by the end of the date, uh, we cannot just um, look into a business opportunity by um, understanding just the foreign C exchange, right? the foreign exchange rates, um, or maybe the uh, purchasing power parities, or maybe um, even with the uh, trade policies, um, or maybe trade agreements. Um, Sometimes you have to also take into consideration of the current state of the economy, especially taking a case in the United States, there have been a really long uh, problems with our trade deficits. So with the United States uh, uh, or the US dollar depreciating um, 55% from the year of 2001 to 2008 and pushing well below purchasing power parity, the US exports were bound to recovery when combined with the experience of the other export powerhouse across the U.S. manufacturing, a merchandise trade deficit of only $464 billion, which is about $270 billion with China alone, um, added to the $128 billion uh, trade surplus in service to yield to a much reduced $336 billion trade deficit in the year of 2003 which is just about 3% of the U.S. GDP. Well, but since then, as the U.S. economy slowly recover, imports have gained slowly, and the trade deficit is now back up to $620 billion in the year of 2015. So this is basically a, a piece of information that you have to take into account uh, because when the United States are trading with the world, we also have to take into consideration of like, are we actually buying more goods than we are importing uh, or we are exporting the goods uh, out to the global world? If the trade deficits um, actually continue to grow, it's a burden to the country. I right? can actually think about we are always buying more goods from the outside world as comparing to we are selling them. Uh, the goods from uh, the local to the global market, um, the country will always having these deficits right, to run uh, as a government. So this will have a significant impact to the long run investments in the United States. But you can also think about, well, it is uh, and long term problems that we have to take into consideration. But in the shorter term, of course, we cannot um, deny the fact that um, when uh, countries like Peru or maybe China, they are having such a, um, a low uh, labor cost in productions, um, it's, it's hard to imagine we are not taking advantage of those uh, lower cost productions uh, somewhere else in the world. But fortunately, um, these um, developing countries like Peru and China has also seen a significant jumps in, jumps in those labor compensation costs. Um, it's almost double in the last decades. Um, and the US manufacturing is now competitive with South Korea and China, and remains about 20 to 25% cheaper than the Europeans um, uh, manufacturing as well. So that's basically an indication that we might actually have a chance to turn this um, deficit around um, even though we are still relying um, so much from um, countries like China or maybe Canada or maybe Mexico, uh, but as long as we can actually continue to uh, improve our technologies and also reducing manufacturing costs, um, we are still be able to uh, reduce this um, uh, trade deficit levels uh, in the long run. If that is the case, well, then you can easily imagine how sometimes governments might actually start um, having policy to support the technological innovations and maybe sometimes uh, to compensate or maybe to subsidize some of the local businesses uh, to make their productions um, locally to play back with this uh, global economy competitions. So again, um, those kind of macroeconomic uh, variables or maybe events 
it's also something that you have to take into consideration when you are making a managerial decisions in your business of, um, within the global economy. Again, we have a very uh, brief um, uh, uh, introduction to the global economy um, in the managerial economics uh, topics. Um, so there are more for you to explore in the textbook reading. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to post your questions on the discussion forum. And um, also um, wish you um, that we uh, you have a, a, a good uh, time uh, reading this uh, textbook uh, readings in chapter six. Um, even though this is a, a, a slightly bit longer chapter that involves a lot of different um, uh, global examples, um, I think this is those are really good examples um, for you to kind of get a sense of how important it is for um, uh, a business owner or maybe a manager to take into account of this uh, global environment factors uh, in running a business in this uh, recent dates. All right, so um, I will see you guys in the next video and um, goodbye.